Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Deneve, and this is my coworker, Kyle Button. We both work for a company called Paychex. Uh, we've both worked for Paychex for anywhere between two and three years. I have over 20 years of uh, IT experience. Kyle has about five years of IT experience, mostly as a developer. For me, mostly in operations. We both work for a team called Infrastructure Platforms. Infrastructure Platforms at Paychex is responsible for all of our storage, server, virtualization, infrastructure as a service, uh, platform as a service for both internal and external use. So you can kind of say that we're the ops side of the DevOps at Paychex. Just really quick, I'm kind of curious, I think somebody else asked this earlier, but how many people here are from the operations side of things? Okay, and how many people from the dev side of things? What we're gonna be talking about is more focused on ops than on dev, but definitely we'll be talking a little bit about both. So just real quick, what is Paychex? I'm gonna read this one exactly. We are the leading provider of integrated human capital management solutions for payroll, HR, retirement, and insurance services. We have over 605,000 payroll clients and we uh, pay one out of every 12 American private sector employees. So a little bit about pay paychecks and our use of OpenShift. We've been using uh, OpenShift since about 2015 when Red Hat shifted over to 3.0 with the Kubernetes backend in, in 2016, we went all in on OpenShift. It's taken on a very viral adoption inside of Paychex. It is our fastest growing infrastructure uh, platform. We have 16 different clusters to cover dev, test, and production across three different data centers in two different regions. We've gone through seven in-place upgrades from OpenShift 3.0 all the way through 3.7 over the past year and a half, two years with zero application downtime during those upgrades. And the applications hosted inside of OpenShift are responsible for moving well over $500 billion per year. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're not gonna talk about putting our business applications into OpenShift. What we wanna talk about today is putting our operational tools, those tools that make the back end, the infrastructure work and help us manage the infrastructure. OpenShift isn't just for business applications and services. By doing, we're gonna talk about how we improve services by running our infrastructure tools in OpenShift and how running the infrastructure tools in OpenShift helped us better understand the OpenShift platform. So to give you an idea, before we moved into OpenShift for IT operations, we had a lot of deployed VMs, we had a lot of uh, different multiple OSs running back end. Um, we were using various automation tools to manage all these different applications and we were lacking a mature CI process. The IT ops organization didn't really understand the potential benefits of moving into OpenShift. We got a lot of the, it's just another tool, I'll wait this one out, isn't this a dev thing? Um, we also underestimated the importance and criticality of running our tools in a highly available platform. This tool's never gone down before, this is way overkill, or we'll just rebuild it if it goes down, where many of the different things that we would think and say. What we needed to do is we needed to do better. We needed to be able to help development teams with questions and issues with the OpenShift platform, and we weren't able to do that because of a lack of understanding of the development side of things. We needed to move outside of our comfort zone. We needed to gain end user experience with the platform. We needed to become more dev-like in our thinking. We needed to understand not just how to deploy the platform, but how to leverage the platform by putting our own tools in it. What we're gonna talk about now is how our team went from a bunch of unknown magician engineers uh, that perform very much unknown magic work to a 1-800 dial-in engineer for our developers. We went from nobodies to somebodies really, really quick. To talk about the application, the first application that we did from an operations perspective, I'm gonna let Kyle tell you a little bit more about that. So we had an application called Fry. And Fry managed our NASs and our SANs, it monitored them, and it was a giant mess of PHP, Python, MySQL, a whole bunch of bash scripts. The code was about four years old, not very well maintained, but it worked. It ran in one data center, 
There was no failover, no business continuity available. If something happened to the server, we would lose a significant amount of insight into our storage platform. And we called it Fry because it managed the tape robots we had, Bender and Flexo. Why they called it Fry, since he can't even manage himself, I don't know. So when we decided to do this, there was a lot of skepticism and unsure thoughts from our team. This was a really critical application, and they were really scared about uplifting everything. So we, we came up with a set of goals. So we needed to change the thinking. We're, we're not a team of developers. We're all in operations. But we needed to start thinking more like them. The other thing I'll mention is hiring a dev to work on your team, such as Kyle, makes a big difference as well. So this application needed a flexible framework that's very well documented. The framework is easily expandable. We needed to have a very resilient architecture. It has to run in multiple geographic locations actively, and we wanted to have multiple instances per data center. We'd like to get it continuously deployable. Every, all our requirements about monitoring, and we're constantly bringing in new tools, we need to quickly make a change to this, this application, this tool, and deploy it. And we'd like to get so that we could deploy it in minutes based on business needs. So we, we implemented this using Python and Django with a MySQL backend with replication, using S3 storage for file persistence when we needed it, and we used a message queuing system for tasks. The tool like this, as long as certain automation tasks got done with our infrastructure, it didn't really matter when they happened. And so how did it go? It became so easy to make a change and deploy it out into production, our senior manager was able to do it within a matter of minutes. And he doesn't have a very technical background. <laughs> We had no more single points of failure, and there was no more application downtime when we had to make deployments. We are constantly monitoring our SAN and our NAS infrastructures now. There's zero gaps in between when we make a deployment, so we're never missing out on any data. It's running active, active, active in those three jet data centers crossed over two regions. And we had issues before where if too much load was going to the application, it would crash. So if too many alerts were being generated or too many people needed to access it, we've got auto-scaling set up, so OpenShift will just spin up more pods for us. And we can easily add new components if we have to. If we need new functionality or new services integrated with this tool, we can just create new pods, add new modules in, and expand the code base very easily and fluidly. But what we did learn was that debugging in OpenShift can be difficult. For this application, we in intentionally sacrificed some traceability for the ease of deployment or development. We're not, as I said, a team of developers, so having to include additional packages was kind of hard, especially when you're trying to trace across you know, three data centers with 12 pods, and all our logging is ephemeral. When the pods die, the logs disappear. So when we do have issues in our production environment, it, it's kind of hard to find them, but with OpenShift, if the pod dies, we don't really care. Eventually, we can get to fixing that bug because usually it's not super critical. We're a lot better at explaining OpenShift concepts, and this helps us out immensely when working with the development teams. When they have to deal with all the different configs and deployment types, we know how quotas really work. We had run into some issues originally with doing deployments and they would you know, fill up all the quota space and the pods would never get created. We learned all the intricacies of services and routes. Having our own application in the platform that we manage allowed us to also troubleshoot issues and find problems with the platform before the development teams and the business applications actually had problems. We've seen this where we were able to find HA proxy issues and correct them before businesses saw them. We've found and corrected issues with scaling and issues with pod deployments. We found a bug within the OpenShift internal registry that we had and we were able to correct that before any development teams or business services were affected. A few other things that we also learned. Um, we got really good at finding actual bugs in the platform itself. We would start testing some of the new features well before they were available for developers. Scheduled jobs was a great example of that. 
I wanted to start using it because I saw a need for it for the developers. And we very quickly came to the concept of we don't use alpha features because of uh, not being quite ready for them yet. Um, additionally, overall, we were able to offer much better service to the development teams. We became an influ influencer of the software development lifecycle and CI process. And we created a much tighter integration and trust between our dev and our ops teams from this uh, process. And that's why it says be prepared. If you were to do something like this, be prepared because um, if anybody here has read the Phoenix project, you know, the, the concept of Brent doesn't scale well. You need to make sure that you disseminate your knowledge to prevent uh, information silos. Create a community of practice, which is what we did, um, in order to make sure that not only is the operations team helping to support OpenShift, but the developers also get involved and are helping to support OpenShift as well, answering each other's questions. This went so well, other operations teams also started to want to get on board. We started bringing in third-party integrations. We brought on our chat as a service. Uh, we've moved a lot of our monitoring tools, uh, Grafana, Prometheus exporters, things of that nature, into OpenShift as well. All these are running in multiple data centers managed by OpenShift, making it much easier for us to worry about the day-to-day -day operations and not trying to keep these applications up and running. We've also moved a lot of deployment automation and infrastructure automation into OpenShift as well. So what's next for Paychex? What we're looking at next is expanding the use of uh, S2I for development. Uh, we've seen a lot of good use case from our own use of that. Um, so we're looking to try and move more of development to use S2I. We're looking at functions as a service. Functions as a service would fit great for operations needs, uh, things like webhooks, uh, callbacks, things of that nature. Uh, working with the service catalog integration for on-prem resources, um, and also looking to move things like Jenkins workers into OpenShift. The other thing I'll say that's not on here is the operators that we heard about earlier today, uh, something else that we're very much interested in trying to start moving into OpenShift uh, to be able to manage the applications that we have there. So, in conclusion, hosting our tools inside OpenShift helped us to build team experience with the OpenShift platform. The features of OpenShift helped us make our IT operations teams better, it may be able to manage workloads, improve efficiencies, and provide better customer experience to your internal or our internal customers. Um, a great way of looking at this is, if you really want to understand the customer experience, be a customer of your own platform. Eat your own dog food, or a better way of saying that I think is probably drink your own champagne, because it sounds much more high class. <laughs> it's a great way to learn about SDLC and SDLC concepts, CI, CD. Um, and a really good quote is, don't be a cost center, don't be another admin, just enable dev and speak their language. And that's what we've been able to do by moving our own tools into OpenShift so that we can really understand the platform. So we made sure to leave a little bit of time for questions if there are any. Um, there were a lot of ops hands up there and these wonderful ops have taken on um, and given us a great talk. There's a question halfway down there. You guys rock. What's that? That, that was rocking. Thank you. Any tips or suggestions or best practices on how to effectively do in-place upgrades? <laughs> so the in-place upgrades, um, we actually did a lot of work uh, using our own Ansible automation. We have a lot of what we refer to as um, paychecksisms um, for our environments, uh, additional outside tools and things like that. So we actually wrote our own automation, building on the automation that we got from Red Hat, but uh, Ansible playbooks and things of that nature to really handle the um, the tasks to roll through those um, upgrades one by one. Yeah, and actually state, uh, to come to the OpenShift roadmap session, we're gonna be talking about um, how we're evolving the current installer, which is OpenShift on RHEL using the Ansible installer, and then um, the, it'll be like the fully immutable installer, which is OpenShift on, um, on the immutable OS, um, and uh, some additional automation that we're gonna be introducing around that, so. Was there questions? There's a question way up here, too, or in the middle. Yeah, are you willing to share the tool 
um, that you guys have written, or is it a proprietary? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't understand. Yeah, the, the tool that you guys have written, the custom tool, um, are you guys willing to share yeah, yeah. the source code or are you gonna open you know, make it an open oh, source? Open source the Fry tool? Is that what you were asking about? Yeah, the tool. <laughs> uh, written, I'm not sure. We been probably tool? not. There's a lot of proprietary code around our own processes that's been baked into it. Um, for sure, there's some components that we might be able to, uh, for example, a lot of integrations with uh, Cisco MDS work that we do. There's not a lot of tools to work with Cisco MDS, and we've had to build a lot of that in-house. Um, so that might be an uh, opportunity for us to open source. All right. There's another one right here. Okay, we'll go. I got a question for you. When you talked about SDLC and you became an influencer, how did they feel about that, the existing team? Actually, um, I've had a lot of experience with it. Uh, the development environment, or the de developers I've worked with have been actually very happy with it. Uh, because it, quite honestly, it did go both ways. Um, I'm not a developer personally, um, so I was able to learn a lot from the development teams um, and development organizations on how um, to use OpenShift as well as us helping to influence them as well. So I, I, it's really uh, worked out very well. Uh, you might have hinted at you mentioned MDS, but how are you providing persistent storage to users, and are you providing um, dynamic options for them? We are not providing persistent storage at this point in time. Uh, we've actually architected uh, in such a way that we don't require persistent storage. Uh, the only uh, exception to that would be uh, S3, or an object-based store that we use um, for shuttling things off that really need long-term storage. Outside of that, we actually don't do persistent storage. Uh, you mentioned active, active, active. Are you running across three data centers with your OpenShift, and how do you have it? Do you have it stretched, or do you have multiple instances? We have multiple instances. The It runs stretched at the application layer, so not at the OpenShift. Yeah, to, to be clear, we have um, three different instances of OpenShift, each running the same set of code, um, and then they're sharing a database back end where needed. Uh, back on the storage question, there are also a couple of sessions this week around uh, what's called container-native storage, which is some work that the Red Hat storage team is doing specifically around uh, storage and OpenShift, uh, in addition to the work that we're doing in Kubernetes to support all forms. So if you're interested in that, uh, check that out. Uh, was there one more question? Okay. Uh, were you able to deploy all your operations tools in OpenShift, or th were there tools that you have for your infrastructure that were not able to be ported into OpenShift for whatever reasons? Did you hear that? I think, and I'm just going to repeat it real quick just to make sure that I understood the question. Was it, was there any tools that we had, we found that we couldn't put into OpenShift? And what did we do? Was that the question? It was yes, a little quiet. Specifically the operations tools that, that you guys, uh, yeah. From, from. Basically, it's, are, your, are your operations tools completely in OpenShift? No, um, it's a process. So there's several operations teams, um, and they can choose to go into OpenShift or not. Uh, most of them right now are still running on traditional infrastructure. The one thing that we are finding is that more and more of those teams are wanting to go into OpenShift because it breaks down a lot of barriers and makes it very easy for them to do their own management um, and uh, deployment of the code as opposed to having to go talk to different teams to say spin up a new VM. Um, or to make changes to those VMs, they're able to do it all themselves because they're running it all inside of OpenShift. All righty then. All right. Thank you very much for that wonderful perspective and insight. <laughs>